Let's see here. <laughs> Sorry, it took me a couple minutes. My computer <laughs> was freaking me out right before this session. It was telling me that it couldn't save my uh, keynote presentation every time I just tried to set save. Restarted, we connected up here, and it was being very, very, very slow. But now we have it just perfect so that it will go on to the next slide when I press the next button. I think we're good. Sorry about the delay. Um, I'm going to talk first about the sprints, um, get this out of the way. How many people have not seen this slide yet in any presentation? Yosef, jeez. <laughs> OK. They're awesome, really do come, they're fun, it's enough. Um, my name is John Albin Wilkins. Um, most people don't know my last name is Wilkins. They just call me John Albin, which is totally fine. It's like Beyonce or Oprah, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, anybody who just calls me John Albin, thanks, doing my ego wonders. Um, on Twitter and the Drupal.org, I am also John Albin. Um, and I work for uh, Amazie Labs um, out of the Zurich office. Um, I've worked there for about a year, and it's been a lot of fun. Um, and in fact, we're hiring. Um, so you can go to that URL, or even better yet, uh, there's an Amazie Labs uh, lounge right next to the Amazie I.O. booth. You'll see lounge with lockers and stuff, and you can come talk to somebody there. Um, I got to start this session with a couple of disclaimers. Right. So the first is that there are lots of JavaScript examples, um, but don't panic. Uh, I'm not going to be teaching you JavaScript. Um, you don't have to understand all the syntax. Um, you're, we're just concerned about the concepts behind the JavaScript, right? Um, and the second disclaimer is, and I can see there's lots of people who are here, this is a beginner session. I've seen a lot of you at a lot of DrupalCons. Really, this is intro to you know, theming, but with a CSS and JS uh, twist to it. Um, and lastly, if you really are a beginner, um, I'm going to be going fast, but there's going to be lots of URLs. You, you know, typically, when you come to a DrupalCon, you just get you know, hit with this wave of information. There will be lots of URLs. You can come back, look at the slides, and go, oh, OK, and then find the documentation for the stuff that we ta talk about today. And unfortunately, there are no funny Morton slides. So if you're here for that, not today. So this session is essentially building components in Drupal. Um, I've given this session a few times before, um, but I decided to do it from a different angle. Usually, I talk about the problems that we encounter as doing Drupal themes. Um, and that necessitates that we're sort of talking about an intermediate level, right? Because you have to have done a lot of Drupal theming before you understand the pains of Drupal theming. So today, I'm going to be talking about the CSS in JS world that uh, the JavaScript community is using a lot. Um, and that will be our sort of touch point for problems doing any sort of front-end development. And then we'll be talking about those concepts inside Drupal and then how to do them in a better, more efficient way inside Drupal 8. So CSS in JS, um, this is a sort of unique uh, term. Um, the, you might ask, why CSS inside the JavaScript? Um, it turns out that this was an, a concept that they came up with because they were already doing HTML inside JavaScript. Um, React uh, popularized this thing called JSX, which is sort of pseudo HTML, which they stick directly inside their JS files. And it was so very natural for them to basically do CSS and HTML inside JavaScript. Right? So the very simple, basic way that you could extend this idea into Drupal is uh, CSS and HTML and JavaScript in PHP. <laughs> We're not going to be doing that. Um, this is a really bad idea. <laughs> uh, but if you feel like uh, trolling anyone on Twitter, especially front end developers, use the uh, CSS, HTML, JS, and PHP hashtag. Now, I, since I'm going to be talking about JavaScript, uh, and 
a lot of us are CSS developers, I wanted to get sort of a, a persona, right, for the, the typical JavaScript developer and the typical CSS developer, so you sort of understand their mindset, right? So uh, here's the typical JavaScript developer. Evilly planning to get rid of all of your CSS and put it inside his JavaScript. Um, and then the typical CSS developer. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, this was, this was, I've tweeted a couple of these before. Um, but, uh, okay, first generation of CSS and JS. So the very first generation of CSS and JS that I saw um, was, was definitely one of these sort of things that developed by uh, a very evil JS person, in my opinion. Um, they did this. So this is some JavaScript syntax here that basically creates a JavaScript object. Um, and instead of using regular CSS keywords, they have to create these camel case keywords because when you're creating a JavaScript object, you can't use background dash color. So now it's camel case, and, and all the values have to be inside strings, so they're quoted. Um, and then you take that JavaScript object and you stuff it into this HTML, which is also inside the same JS file. Um, and, oh, oh, and, and this is JSX. This is the very beginning part of JSX here, the, the return statement. You have an HTML tag, any sort of attributes that you have. Um, you can add different JavaScript values inside these curly brackets. Um, and then, you know, your contents of a tag. That's what's called JSX. Um, and that's the HTML-ish stuff that's inside React components. And when I first saw this, I had a lot of questions. Um, and they were all, why? <laughs> why, 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 why would you do this? <sighs> Um, this generates inline CSS as a styles attribute. Um, and it's just a really bad idea. Um, I would talk to JavaScript developers and be like, but you can't do media queries, right? And they were like, oh, well, it's just JavaScript. We'll just check the window width inside JavaScript and then change the CSS, no problem. You can't use before and after attributes. And they're like, we'll just add real DOM elements inside our components. Um, and yet, despite how, how crazy this seems to be, um, we can actually learn something. So first lessons learned. Let's look at separations of concerns. Uh, this is a concept in computer science um, and one that we've been applying to the web for probably like 20 years almost. And the idea here traditionally is that you keep, you separate the concerns in order to um, make sure that these things are independent and are easier to maintain and to build. Um, and we've traditionally thought of that as having our behavior inside JavaScript files, our design inside CSS files, and our content and structure inside HTML. Um, but this separation is quite flimsy um, because the HTML has classes in it, right, for the CSS. So if you ever want to change the design, you have to change the classes, which means you need to change the HTML. And same with the JavaScript. There's IDs and data attributes, and those things also need to be changed in the HTML whenever you need to change how the JavaScript works, right? So. Back when we were first sort of considering these, in 2003, a very famous website was call, created called the CSS Zen Garden. Um, and it tried to solve this separation of concerns idea by using what I call content semantics for the CSS class names. Um, and what do I mean by that? Class name semantics. So. Semantics just means some sort of meaning, right? And if we compare 
a content semantic versus a design semantic, what I really mean is that I'm creating a class name that is article-link for content semantics and a green button for design semantics. And that is literally describing what it is versus what it looks like. Right. So you can create any class name that you want. I mean, semantics just means some sort of meaning. And um, the CSS and Garden decided that it was going to use content semantics and describe what each chunk of HTML was. And that would allow you to uh, change the design without having to change any of the class names, because the class names were tied to what kind of HTML it was, essentially, what kind of content was inside that HTML. Um, so you would look at a typical uh, CSS, er, sorry, the CSS Zen Garden site had one set of HTML, and then it had like 218 variations, different CSS files that you could apply to this one set of HTML. And it was very influential because it got people to actually start using CSS and thinking about it in a new way compared to the whew, super old table-based background colors inline way that we used to build websites. <clears throat> and you can see all these classes are, are using uh, the class names describe the content, the structure of the HTML, and not the design, which meant that you could change the design from this to this to this just by changing the CSS file that was actually attached to it. And it was highly influential. And the reason why I'm talking about it, of course, is that the Drupal code base uh, was sort of based off this idea. And the Zen theme was actually named in honor of the CSS uh, Zen garden. I'm going to grab some water because So understanding uh, what problems the CSS garden fixed and what problems it created is important for understanding Drupal 8 today. So the CSS garden, uh, just like the code base of Drupal, has uh, its CSS separate from the HTML. Uh, but our JavaScript is not really fixed at all, um, and we've created some new problems. So let's look at Drupal's content semantics problem. Um, we have some classes like title, um, which you can style and add any CSS that you want to. Um, but if you want to have slightly different styling for a title, if it's a block title, that means that you have to add context or add additional selectors to your rule set in order to do new CSS. A lot of times you're like turning off CSS properties in this new rule set. Um, and then because title is used in a lot of different places, you may end up adding more rules. And so this would be styling the node titles. And uh, if you wanted to have one change on one particular page, that means you had to add more and more CSS selectors uh, to your rule sets. Um, and there's a very specific uh, term for this uh, in the front-end developer community, um, and it is called uh, CSS specificity wars, um, where you have to continually add um, more and more, or higher and higher specificity to your rule sets in order to make CSS changes. Um, and this leads to just longer and longer rule sets and uh, more brittle uh, style sheets. And it becomes really hard to maintain. So let's jump back to this uh, first lessons learned. Uh, by the way, I, I, I've stole the content of this slide um, from Cristiano Rostelli, who came up with uh, this original content. Um, it's fantastic. That's the URL for his uh, slide presentation. So compared to um, the traditional way of thinking about separation concerns, what are the CSS and, and JavaScript, like even that inline CSS, what is it trying to accomplish? It's still trying to think about separation concerns, but it's thinking about it in a completely different way. Now we have a component, a button. The concern is I want to style this button. 
I want it to have a certain interaction. I want it to do something. I want it to have this content. This is a button. That is my concern. And it can have HTML and CSS and JavaScript in it. It doesn't matter that they're separate technologies. This, the concern isn't the technologies. The concern is the thing you're trying to accomplish. And for a component like button, it is, it's like, I want to press a button. Same thing with uh, modals, uh, medias, putting an image with like a caption on it. This is how that very first uh, CSS and JavaScript project was trying to solve this separation of concerns. And this was uh, very in influential, um, even though most people, most CSS developers who looked at that original CSS and JS hated it, they, didn't, they couldn't figure this out. I didn't either. Um, but this was the idea behind what they were doing. Um, so those of you who are new to component-based design, let's go through a couple concrete examples of what I mean by components. Uh, so on this website, uh, we can draw a box around like this and say, this is a component. This is my header. It has some navigation in there. Um, I will, I'm only concerned about styling the header um, and concerned about styling the links, uh, maybe doing JavaScript interactions for the menu that pops out. Um, that is the, a single component. This is also can be a component. Um, it's the main article. It has image. It has you know, some uh, taxonomy terms here, little teaser text. Um, we create a chunk of design that includes some HTML and any JavaScript that's needed. Here's some more components. Uh, this component is actually used twice on the page. You can see here just to the right of it. So the component can be reused. Right? It can also be nested. You can see here that we've used this little red circle in inside two different components. Right? Um, and so we can nest different components, um, and they work just fine. Um, and then the last one here is, uh, this is actually just, its concern is layout. Right? It's doing the layout for three columns. And it doesn't actually care what's inside each of these columns. Like, these two columns have some nested component. And this first column has a completely different nested component. The layout component does not care what its children are. It's just concerned about three columns. Done. So let's go over that again. What is a component? A single component is a chunk of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and maybe some images as well. Basically, any assets that you can add to a web page that can be encapsulated inside a component. It has a unique and separate responsibility. It's repeatable. It's nestable. Uh, and lastly, it can have design variations. So for example, if you had a red button, uh, and then you also wanted a gray button, you wouldn't put those in separate components. It'd be one component, and you would have a way to tell the component, please you know, show me the design for the primary button, like red, or like, show me the design for the uh, secondary component, which is like gray. Right? So each component can have some different variations. Um, but they have very specific purposes, right? So let's go on to the second generation of CSS and JavaScript. They created a CSS file. This made a lot of CSS developers go, yay! Um, so this is a very normal CSS file. Um, button class, um, normal properties, great. Then they had a button.js file. Um, and they would import uh, from the button.css file into this variable name styles right here. Um, and uh, there are some really uh, interesting technologies, Webpack um, and, and, and a lot of other stuff that does some magic. Basically, what it does is it takes uh, this style sheet um, and creates a JavaScript object with like a list of all of the class names that are defined inside that CSS file. And so here, we're again returning JSX. Um, JavaScript can't have a keyword that's called class because that's a reserved word in JavaScript. So they have to say class name when 
React actually prints this out, it converts the class name back to class when it actually exports the, CS the HTML. Uh, but class name equals styles.button. So we're referencing a particular rule set inside our CSS file and using that class name inside this HTML chunk. Um, and, and this brings us to our second lesson that we've learned from CSS and JavaScript, which is that you can organize your theme by components. Right? So the old way of organizing our theme was very much in line with that old way of thinking about uh, separation of, of concerns. We would have a CSS directory, maybe just like one CSS file, um, a whole bunch of images inside an images folder, a whole bunch of JavaScript, or maybe just one JavaScript file with like Drupal behaviors, if you're familiar with that, all in one file. And then our HTML in a completely different folder, uh, the templates folder. And, but there's no reason we have to do this. Um, we can actually reorganize it so that we have a components folder. And inside our components folder, each component gets its own directory with which holds all of the stuff that it needs, like the HTML, in this case with twig file, the CSS, the JavaScript, any images that it needs, it's all together in one place. This makes it very easy to maintain the website because if you know what design you're looking at, you can find all the stuff that's about that component right in one folder. Um, we will get into exactly how this works if you're a new person uh, to, to Drupal, uh, to Drupal theming, um, in later slides. Um, but just recognize that we've, we've consolidated everything about a chunk of HTML, a chunk of a component into one folder. Okay. Third generation of CSS and JavaScript. Uh, this is the latest one. This one's going to be a lot harder to describe. Okay. So uh, this is called styled components. Um, and you can see that it still has like regular CSS properties here, but then there's these like weird like back ticks around it. And in JavaScript, that basically means it's a string. Uh, so we've got a string that has the CSS properties, no class name at all. Um, and then we have this thing that says style.a, and down here we have this style.img. So what this is actually doing is it's creating a JavaScript object that knows when it is used on the page, it's going to be an img tag. It knows it's going to be an a tag. That's what that syntax means. So we're creating two different uh, elements here. One's a link and one is an image. And then we're going to use it. Remember, we're going to return JSX. Here's the JSX that we're going to use. Now, instead of using uh, you know, HTML, just like that normal H normal ish HTML, like we were doing last time, we're now using the name that we created, the variable name that we created here. So this, this link was assigned to the uppercase button JavaScript variable name. So now in our HTML element, we're using the name button instead of A. And all it has is a, an href attribute because you have to point it somewhere, right? It's a link. But it doesn't specify the style at all. The button variable actually knows what it is, but you don't have to specify it in this part of the JavaScript file. And the same thing with our image. Remember, we assigned it to the icon variable. We are inside our Java, a JSX. We are outputting an icon element, and we give it a source. Right? And when React goes and renders this with style components, it transforms it. Oh, I'm going to do it in two parts here. First into this. So you can see here that it's created a real chunk of CSS. This is a, this, what I'm going to show you is all going to be HTML. So this is a real chunk of CSS inside a style tag. And those properties that were assigned to the button variable 
are now inside this class, underscore 23, right? And, and the icon that has been assigned to this other class here. And it also will output the HTML. So that we've got our link, a class, and it's using those really funky looking class names there. Inside our image, inside our a, our link element. So what's going on here? What, has, what it has decided is that if you've ever seen sort of CSS naming conventions in like BEM or Smacks, this is basically saying, I don't care what the class name is. That stuff is too hard for me. I'm just a JavaScript developer. So it's going to create all the class names for the JavaScript developer. This is actually kind of nice. I would like to not have to think about BEM naming conventions. And that's what they did. They've enforced the BEM structure of like having a class for each element inside, each HTML element inside your component. So like the image and the, and the link elements each get their own class name. But it has, it doesn't care at all about the naming conventions. It just cares that they are unique CSS class names. So this is the third lesson here. We're scoping locally and not globally. And what I mean by that is when we look back at that title class that we had, this class name is just a little bit too generic. Um, it's a content semantic class name, but it's used in a lot of different places. And CSS class names are always global. Like there currently isn't a way to make CSS local. Maybe some like, you know, some, some dev feature inside Chrome or something like that, uh, but not available to, to production uses of, of web browsers. So CSS is always globally, and we're going to create a very specific class name that essentially only applies locally. It only gets applied to that chunk of HTML that you created, right? So even though technically it's still a global CSS class name, you're never going to get the same class name in all your other components that you use on the page. OK, let's look at the fourth lesson that we learned here. And that is that we prevent unused CSS. Now, this is, this is really simple. When you add a component, a JavaScript component to a page, it adds the HTML, CSS, JavaScript, whatever images to the page because you added that component to it. And when you do not add a component to a page, you do not add the CSS and JavaScript to the page. <laughs> this is really, really simple. <clears throat> if we look at how Drupal 7 traditionally does a theme, we usually have like one giant CSS file and one giant JS file. Um, and if you like to break your CSS files into smaller chunks, it still will do CSS aggregation and make it into one giant chunk for you. Um, but we would like to improve front end performance, right? We don't want all the CSS for the entire site loaded on every single page. Ideally, for front end performance, we would like just the CSS that's actually on the page to load. Um, and it turns out we can do that in Drupal 8. I'm going to go over these, these in details in, in later slides, but let me briefly describe how that happens. We're going to add a component CSS in JavaScript in what's called a library that's only used by that component. And then we will add that library from the twig file, which contains our HTML. Um, and that means that when Drupal builds a particular page, it's going to be grabbing these components, which are twig files. And uh, obviously, when it outputs the page, it's only going to have the HTML from the twig files that it grabbed. And those twig files will say, hey, I would like to add a library for my little chunk of HTML. It includes this CSS and this JavaScript. 
and that means that Drupal 8 will be able to only give you CSS you actually need for the page. Um, Ricky Bacow, and I really hope that I'm pronouncing her last name properly. I used to work with her, but I always said, hi, Ricky. Um, anyway, uh, she tried this out. Uh, and there's a blog post here on uh, this website. And she found that it halved the CSS that was actually loaded on a page. This is great result. OK. Now, let's get into some details. Let's actually build a Drupal 8 component. And we're going to start with create a theme using a .info.yaml file. See, I told you this was a beginner session. Okay. So uh, inside our themes folder, we'll create a OIDA folder. Yes? OK. OIDA.info.yaml. Um, YAML file, we specify what the name of our theme is, uh, what kind of thing, what kind of Drupal thing this is, which is, it's a theme. Give it a quick description. Tell, it that it's, tell Drupal that it's compatible with Drupal 8 which is the core line there. Um, base theme regions, you can read all about that information inside this website. And then let's look at the libraries there. So we're adding one library, uh, which I've called OIDA slash HTML element styles. And this is essentially just like your reset rule or your normalize. You're just trying to add some CSS that styles, that, that the CSS rule sets in this library will just, the selectors will just be HTML elements. So like you'll have a P as a selector, and then you'll describe how you want to style paragraphs, right? This is, this library is specified inside the .info.yaml file says load this library on every single page because we're probably going to need most of it, right? This is the only thing that I recommend that you load on every single page. All the other components will be, have different libraries, which we'll show on the next slide here. But this is the one global library that it will add for every single page, and you add it by using the .info.yaml file. So now let's create a components library. This is in the themes oida, oida.libraries.yaml. And we just tell Drupal what the name of the library is. Um, we're going to create a button component, so let's just call this library button, right? So button colon, and then it create it has some CSS and JavaScript, and the syntax here is that you um, specify component. This is a little bit of boilerplate, and then you specify the path to your CSS file. Um, template slash button slash styles dot CSS, um, and our JavaScript again template slash button slash behavior dot JS. And this will create a library that Drupal will recognize. The full name of it will be OIDA slash button. And talk about why these files are inside a template slash button in a second here, because next slide is create a components directory. This is inside Drupal 8's themes directory. We've created an OIDA directory. Drupal 8 um, has a, uh, a rule that it says that all of your html.twig files have to go inside a templates folder. Um, there are ways to change that default behavior with extra modules, um, but I'm just going to talk about what Korg does for right now. So you have to create a templates folder, because otherwise Drupal won't find any of your twig files. So once we have a templates folder, we'll just start putting our components in there. Create a button folder add our JavaScript, add our CSS. Um, and in this case, we're going to use uh, field dash dash field dot dash link dot HTML dot twig. I will come back to this naming convention here in a second uh, of, of the name of the twig file, I should say. The CSS file and the behavior file, you can name it whatever, right? It, it just has to match what you specify in the libraries.email file, right? So this is this path, template slash button dot style dot CSS, matches this path inside our OIDAs. Templates slash button slash styles.css. So that's what you're doing inside the libraries file. 
um, we're specifying the path, we're creating the same structure when we're actually creating files. So uh, let's go and uh, create a twig file now. Um, I, I wish that I had more time to talk about how you pick a particular uh, twig file name. Um, that's, I, I just don't have time to talk about it. Um, but there, because I could talk for like half an hour on it. Um, but there is a URL here on twig template naming conventions. It will, um, inside the Drupal 8 documentation, it will tell you that you should uh, enable twig debugging. And this means that you can look at the page source when you have your Drupal site open, and it will print out some HTML comments inside the source that says, by the way, this chunk of HTML is coming from this file. And it'll show you field.html.twig, um, and then all these other different options you can choose from. We've chosen one of those options. In this case, field dash dash field link. This means as a type, the field that we've added to this particular entity uh, is a link field. Um, and we're adding some HTML to this file. These uh, last three lines are straight out of the you know, default field.html.twig file. And the important one here is the very first one here. It says attach library, and then parentheses, oida slash button. Now, attach library is a special Drupal 8 uh, function that it is added to Twig that says, when we actually grab this Twig file and render it, we also want to attach all the assets that are specified in this library. Okay. So remember, we created the library to say, add this what, template slash buttons slash styles.css file, and also the template slash button slash behavior.js. So when Drupal sees this line as it's rendering the Twig file, it will also go ahead and add that CSS and that JavaScript file to that particular page that it is creating. And uh, there's more documentation about attached library here. And, and that's it. Like, we don't have to get any more complicated than this. This is a very simple way to do components inside Drupal 8. Um, I, uh, last year at DrupalCon New Orleans, I talked about a more advanced way. And it turns out to be it's really advanced. It's really hard. I can do it, but I have like a you know, ninja level Drupal theming experience because I've wrote and written part of the system. Um, but this is very basic. This is easy for beginners to get a hold of, um, and I think it's very doable for everybody in the Drupal community. And, um, I would love to talk more again about how to name the twig files, um, but I'm going to give you some hints here about what comes next as far as once you've done this basic version of components inside Drupal 8. Um, learned about li oops, libraries override uh, in the info.yaml file. Sometimes Drupal adds more CSS than you actually want on a page. Um, and this comes because the classy base theme comes with lots of CSS uh, to be useful. Um, but sometimes when we're trying to create our component, we discover that classy is adding some extra CSS, which we're having to override. And anytime we're trying to override a rule set that Drupal adds by default, it's probably better to just tell Drupal not to add that CSS, and that will make your component CSS much cleaner. So you can learn about that here, override extend. And I'm going to give you one more tip for intermediate level Drupal theming. Uh, there was a session yesterday on UI patterns. Um, it has an RC1 release. It is not quite you know, fully baked, um, but it looks very, very promising. Um, and I am definitely going to be keeping an eye on it. It will solve the, the weird uh, HTML naming convention thing that I didn't get to talk about, like field dash dash, field dash link, dot HTML dot twig. With this module, you would be able to create a button dot HTML dot twig file. And then through the UI, tell Drupal, 
By the way, when you render the link field, please use the button.html.twig file. I like this concept a lot. Um, so definitely, when you're ready for it, uh, check it out. Hopefully, by then, it will have a 1.0 official release instead of just an RC1. So what did you think? So last time I gave a talk, I got one person to fill out the questionnaire, and all they did was complain about my jokes. <laughs> so <laughs> can you please at least have two people complain about my jokes this time? <laughs> Um, so, thank you. Danke. And if you have questions, please come up to the front here. Hi. So my question is, um, in the examples that you showed us, we saw those uh, funky class names that were generated. And you showed us some simple styles uh, of how you make a link look like a button and so on. But uh, my question is, how does it work for styling, having dynamic styles? I mean things that will be based either on um, pseudo classes and pseudo elements or also on um, HTML attributes. A good example would be, like, can you package up the focus style for a button? or if you wanted to style a, a details and summary element and give it a really cool um, mm -hmm. open-close uh, icon uh, yeah. based on the open attribute? That is a great question and makes me realize that I should have added one more slide to this slide deck um, about the naming conventions that you can use since we can't use... Um, I gave a presentation... Um, it wasn't DrupalCon. It was DrupalCon Los Angeles. Uh, where I gave a presentation about BEM uh, naming, CSS naming conventions. Um, if you're interested in that, that will tell you exactly how to name it. But I, I would also give the advice, if you don't want to go with BEM, that all you need to do, like you don't need to stress out about it, the, the important thing is that when you're writing your CSS file for your component, give it a unique class name. It doesn't matter what it is. If your component has multiple HTML elements inside it, each of those HTML elements will likely need its own unique class name. Just make sure it's a unique class name, not used by any other Drupal thing or any other component, and you'll be fine. Like naming conventions, like the, the CSS and JavaScript, that's, those naming conventions are blood curdling, <laughs> right? So it doesn't matter what it actually is, just as long as they're unique. So when you're creating, uh, you know, when you're creating your CSS file, you can just, you can, you can use SAS or you can use just vanilla CSS um, and just, uh, you know, like button, uh, colon, colon, after for, you know, after. And if you had um, like, like an image in your button, you could have button, I don't know, underscore, underscore, icon or something like that. So the thing that will be generated will look like, um, you know, generated funky class Sorry, are you name. talking about in, in JavaScript or in no, for mean, when I you're mean creating like, it for J Drupal? So say you wanted the focus styles for a button to be packaged up in a component. Would mm -hmm. you, in, in your, your style sheet, you have button dash focus like you normally would? Bu button, no, colon no focus. button just colon focus, yeah. right? This is a normal CSS selector. And, and if we're talking about Drupal 8. What does it do? Is it generates the CSS and generates two styles or? So in Drupal 8, not, not, not the JavaScript, right? Right. Okay. So in Drupal 8, that CSS file that you point to um, inside your uh, libraries.yaml file, that path should be a generic, or sorry, a vanilla CSS file. So if you use CSS, you have to point it at the generated CSS, right? So if you're using SAS, for example, you would need a separate uh, SAS file, and it would need to actually create a real CSS file for that little chunk of SAS, right? So that little chunk of CSS can have as many rule sets as you want inside it, right? So button, colon, button, colon, brackets, whatever those styles, button, colon, uh, hover, comma, button, cover, focus, and then brackets, yeah. Okay. okay. 
Yeah, usually the selling point for aggregation is that you have, instead of multiple files, you have just one CSS file because everything's put together. And then, of course, this one is bigger because it contains a lot of stuff that you don't need at this moment. Otherwise, you would have different aggregated files on each page. So mm -hmm. um, is it worth it to um, have this? Or is there a problem having m more uh, separate CSS files if right. they are smaller? So So by creating uh, components in this way, you have maximum flexibility on how the uh, aggregated CSS file for a particular page gets generated. Right? The default way that Drupal will do it is just whatever happens to be on this page, that's the CSS that will go in it to it. And you're absolutely right that on a different page, it'll have a slightly different aggregate. Um, Drupal uh, will try to, a little bit, try to have a couple different aggregate files, um, and sometimes they will match across different files, and they'll just be like, like two of the aggregate files may match on two different pages, and then one of them will be different. But there is uh, a, another module called Advanced CSS Aggregator or something like that that can give you more control over how do you want to compile, compile yeah, how do you want to aggregate your CSS files, because sometimes certain components will naturally be on the same pages together. So you can create like a, a grouping of components. Like when this one component comes, just give all the CSS to JavaScript for the rest of them too because they're likely to be on the same page. So you can tell the module, create these groupings of components to make the aggregates um, more efficient when you're traveling across the, the website, right? Now, a lot of websites, you'll have like one page hit, right? They'll read a page and then they'll leave. Right? So in that case, you want the least amount of CSS for that one page hit. So, but it, it totally depends on what kind of user you have on the site. There's no like easy solution for this problem. But definitely this method of specifying little chunks of CSS will give you the flexibility to do more advanced things. Yeah, I was somehow assuming from your session that you are giving up on the aggregation altogether. No, 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 I'm not giving up on it. It's just <laughs> like... <laughs> and Advoc is just a lot of, it's quite complicated to configure, I think. It's mm, yeah, it's, yeah, it's hard to configure and it's hard to strategize these things, but this will give you the flexibility that you, you, that's required to do those kind of, that kind of work. Anything else? I'm gonna stick around for another 10, 15 minutes, so if you have more questions that you don't wanna be recorded, I'll be right here. Thank you very much.